Hey guys, it's Bella and we have now come to the very last video in these um, paleography guides or at least the last script in these paleography guides and that is the very fancy humanist script which is uh, in Latin a litera humanista which was developed in the or used rather in the 14th and 16th to 16th centuries and here we have on the left a uh, renaissance drawing of two very important po poets which they're not actually humanist poets but they their works would be much copied during the humanist period and that is Dante Alighieri and Petrarch so before we talk about humanist script we actually need to recap two different scripts for reasons that you'll understand later so Litera Carolingiana Cursiva, or Caroline Minuscule Script, was a script developed at Charlemagne's court in the 9th century, and it soon spread around Europe. We've got a whole video on that that you can have a look at on this channel. And it was used for all purposes, regardless of how prestigious the text was. Its main distinguishing features are the small round unto A, looped G, straight back D, generally a rounded nib, and the consistent use of a cursive tool S. Here you can see the letter forms of Caroline Minuscule. At the bottom you can see some basic ligatures that you get in this script. You can see the the tall S's uh, in the at the start of the third line. You can notice that it doesn't really have any serifs. It's got quite a round nib, um, rounded letters, quite pretty to look at. Um, here's a sample of it and I will read this out to you. It says, uh, religiosa queram vidua in proximo vico habitans postulans a patre eus ut sancta brigita secum exirvet ad synodum um, so this is this says in latin a certain religious widow in the next town over li living in the next town over asking her father that Saint Bridget might go with her to the the synod, the synod of presumably of bishops or of local clergy. And this is from a manuscript of the life of Saint Bridget, so a fun saint's legend. And it's written in a rather common, unproblematic form of Caroline minuscule, so you have a sense of what it looks like. We also need to recap Gothica Textura script, which in Latin is Litera Gothica Textualis. And this is a minuscule script which developed its proper form in the 13th century, and it would go on to be the first script used in printing, which is relevant for our video here as well. Most famously, it would be used in the Gutenberg printing press. And the distinguishing features of Gothic script, which developed very slowly from Caroline minuscule script, includes H, M, and N with slight leftward leaning descenders. The cross shaped biting T is really uh, characteristic of Gothic. It doesn't happen before the Gothic era. You have a th very thick nib and the formation of curved letters with short vertical strokes, especially minims, rather than with curved strokes. Quite developed use of punctuation, including dotted I's, full stops, sometimes commas, and even hyphens. Um, frequent abbreviation and biting of vowels with adjacent consonants, and more frequent use of the majuscule S than in Carolingian or Proto-Gothic, and a differentiation between I, J, U, V, and W, plus the use of pencil line marking rather than scoring in manuscripts. So here is Gothic Textura script. You can see the letter forms. We've got a video discussing these letter forms more properly, so I won't go into it too much here. And here's a very pretty illuminated example of a gothic manuscript with some music on the left hand side and they well i believe these are probably lyrics on the right hand side and some very amusing scenes of children playing which is you know nice a little bit of everyday life from the middle ages so some history for context um the renaissance the beginning of the renaissance in script so, from the late 1300s onwards, Western Europe became a lot more obsessed with the classical world, especially because so many ancient texts started to enter Latin translation because of the contacts with the Arab world brought about by the Crusades. Humanist scholars, especially in Italy, started to preserve the classical texts, and they were particularly interested in the Latin of authors such as Cicero, 
and at this time they did a lot of work to reconstruct the original pronunciation of vowels in Latin verse because Latin verse or Roman poetry um, is pronounced and recited based on the length of syllables which in classical Latin was quite important and it could distinguish certain words like annus versus annus um, for ring versus old lady respectively and in vulgar Latin as early as the 300s or 400s common era this distinction between long and short vowels was already decaying in some areas as we hear in the writings of Saint Augustine of Hippo and so of course in medieval Latin they seem not to have pronounced the long and short vowels as distinct any longer and so it's a bit of a mystery how well they're not quite a mystery I suppose they must have not known what they understood the rules for producing some kinds of Latin poetry but they didn't understand this proper context for pronunciation but in the Renaissance they started to do a lot of work on reconstructing these original lengths of vowels and these are sort of the beginnings of classics as we understand it today as a modern academic discipline. The earliest manuscripts of these classical texts which the humanists found, so the earliest versions of the Roman texts such as Cicero, Sallus, etc, these were written in Carolingian script for the most part because manuscripts from earlier periods tended not to survive as well and because they were written in Carolingian script from a few centuries earlier, remember the humanists are working in the 1300s, 1400s and Carolingian script was written in the 800s. The humanists, when they saw this, they assumed that Carolingian script was how the Romans actually wrote because all of the earliest versions of Roman texts are written in Caroline. And because of this, humanists tried to copy Caroline script, but they weren't successful. Um, so Caroline minuscule, sorry, not Caroline minuscule, humanist minuscule is basically a medieval forgery. It's an attempt by medieval people to to fake the Caroline minuscule script thinking that it's the Roman script and the best way to identify the difference because they can be deceptively similar sometimes. Sometimes the scribes are very good frauds. Um, sometimes the best way is actually to contrast the same text word for word. So um, this is the text of Psalm 1 in both a Carolingian minuscule script which is in the top and a humanist minuscule script at the bottom um, and it says qui non habit in concilio in piorum et in via peccatorum non stet in cathedra in, um, in cathedra uh, derisorum non sedit etc and um, so we can see some of the differences by examination here so first of all um, the spacing between the words is much more consistent in the bottom one because they've inherited that tradition from the Gothic. In the third line of the bottom one, we have a hyphen for the word pestilentiae, which is not found in the original. We also see the use of the AE ligature, the biting AE, which is borrowed from Gothic and which is not at all common in Carolingian. In fact, in Carolingian, they'd be much more likely to write it with the E caudata. Um, we can also see in that word pestilentiae, uh, I don't think we can see it elsewhere, but we can see that the rounded Gothic S, which you never see or almost never see in Carolingian minuscule, and in the word abit, um, statit, cathedra, we can see a T which is crossed, it's biting, and this is not found in Carolingian at all. The, the T is sort of much more like a capital T we have today. Um, we can also see... What do we have... As for other features, yes, we can see the use of commas in the bottom sample in a way that we don't see in the top sample. Um, now this, so these are some of the ways in which we can tell that the bottom one is not in fact an original Caroline minuscule uh, manuscript. Um, the bottom humanist script actually happens to be um, King Henry VIII's personal Psalter from the 1500s and it has some little notes in his handwriting and this is just one of the best ones it's so funny so he's like so the text of this says is blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the unjust and Henry has written next to it quis sit beatus which in Latin is like who is the blessed one it's me <laughs> I just really love how he's like there, like bigging himself. Because that's the, it's not, no one's reading this, it's just him. It's just his personal book, and he's like, 
I'm the best. I am tremendous. Believe me. It's brilliant. And we have some really cool artwork in this same manuscript where we can see a cute little portrait of King Henry VIII reading his little psalter and he's got these little books and a really pretty room and it's it's just really lovely. I love this. Okay, so um, this brings us on to talking about art as part of the Renaissance. Um, because while these developments in the scholarship of Latin were taking place, there were significant changes also in artistic styles. So there was an increasing emphasis on naturalism to the human form and to the natural world. And in the 15th century, one can see that some of the first portraits and sculptures which are unique enough to be recognisable as individual faces. Whereas in medieval art, most of the faces were basically cartoons. They all looked sort of the same and they were just copy pasted. And the only way you could tell that an image is meant to depict someone is either if they had some kind of heraldic display, they had a kind of symbol, the context of a scene might tell you because you can identify it that as a story from a person's life or if they just have a name attached to the to the picture that's how you could tell that it's an image of someone whereas in the renaissance you start to get much more detailed depictions of faces and so you can sort of identify the image of a person from a port from a portrait and in fact that's why if we look at the image of henry VIII, it this image is familiar to people who have seen other uh, state drawings of King Henry VIII. It's a recognisable face. Um, modern day Belgium and Italy became quite prestigious centres of art and Belgium in particular was one of the first places that produced significant landscape illuminations. And this actually, the practice of painting landscapes originally developed from illuminated manuscripts like this where you would have a scene of an interior scene usually like a, a dressing room or a draw room and you'd have a window that faced into the outside and they would paint really tiny versions of the natural world in that window scene and these windows got bigger and bigger over time until many until the sort of landscape paintings became a valuable work of art in their own right in the 1400s and 1500s and at the same time, you also had quite a burgeoning sculpture industry wherein people tried to recreate the Greco-Roman sculptures that were so selling for really high prices at the time. And these skills, you remember on the canvases and portraits and frescoes, they were initially developed as extensions of Gothic manuscript illumination. Here is an example of some of this like uh, landscape painting writ, writ large and this is a fresco by Ambrogio Lorenzetti and it's called The uh, Effects of Good Government in the City. And I mostly just wanted to include the painting because A, it's quite big, it's lovely, but also it, it's just charming. It gives us these little scenes of everyday life. We have people riding through on horses. We've got uh, ladies looking, there's two people, two women in the bottom left corner gossiping. There are people in the centre scene uh, dancing to the beat of a, like literally you can see a tambourine there. We can see uh, behind the, the dances um, a man on a horse with an odd hat who looks like he's wearing chainmail. Might he be some kind of police officer? Um, we can also see people engaged in conversation, playing games, engaged in their crafts. We can see people sewing. We can see a master teaching his students. Uh, we can see poorer people, richer people, all gathered together in the city life, construction workers even, of this Italian city. There's so much little detail here in this like daily life of Ita of medieval Italy and it's quite, I just quite love being able to have that insight in the Gothic era. Here are also some examples of late medieval portraiture and art. So this is one of the portraits, I don't know who it's of, but it's, it, you know, it goes to illustrate my point from earlier that this is detailed enough that you can identify, you could probably identify this woman if you were to see her in the flesh from having seen this portrait. And then we've got this very beautiful statue of the Virgin Mary with the sort of draped clothing borrowed from Byzantine iconography. And all of this context brings us at last to discussing in more precise form Litera Humanista, also known as Humanist Minuscule. So as we said earlier, Litera Humanista was an attempt by humanist scholars to imitate Carolingian script and 
it is the script that they had thought was the script in which the Romans wrote, even though it was not in fact that. So Littera Humanista, along with Gothic, was one of the earliest typefaces, and by the 1500s it was actually the predominant type font outside of the Germanic Sprachbund. And the way the way that we can tell whether a manuscript is humanist or Caroline is the fact that they were trying to imitate Carolingian script. They they couldn't imitate it perfectly because they're learning also how to write Gothic script and most of the books they're reading will be in Gothic script. So they have a few Gothic quote unquote corruptions in their writing. And these are some of the ways we can tell. So they have a late medieval orthography, punctuation, and of course a pencil ruled page layout. The pencil ruled page layout is a dead giveaway because Carolingian manuscripts would be scored rather than drawn in with pencils. A biting T is also the really a diagnostic letter because that never happens in the Carolingian era. The G is actually rather than having an open descender it sort of loops around and it almost looks like glasses like a pair of spectacles it's kind of weird. Also if we see the use of Arabic numerals rather than Roman at all that's a dead indication that it's a humanist script rather than Carolingian because obviously the Arabic numerals weren't in use in Europe at the time then. You had dotted eyes and a lack of e cow data in humanist mean school. So they would dot their eyes as a practice borrowed from Gothic, but also they would they wouldn't draw the tail at the end of the E because by the Gothic era the e cow data had become so common that scribes stopped drawing in the tail, partly because they were just pronouncing it as an E anyway. They weren't pronouncing it as I or A, they were pronouncing it as a E. And so Gothic scribes stopped writing the tail and humanist scholars forgot it was there altogether. So if they were copying a text, they might just write out the E, forget to draw in the tail, whereas a Carolingian person would definitely write the tail because they are still mindful of it. In humanist script, you would have these H's, M's and N's with these slightly leftward sloping minims, whereas this didn't happen very often in Carolingian minuscule. And in humanist mean school, actually, they, even though Carolingian mean school tends to use a relatively thin nib, humanist mean school tends to use an even thinner nib, and it doesn't really have serifs or lozenge ends on minims like we have in some early proto-Gothic Carolingian text, Carolingian um, scripts. So here is the typeface for humanist mean school script. You can see that they have both forms of the S as well. That's another giveaway. They'll often use the Gothic. A curved S, whereas the Carolingians would always use the tall, uh, straighter S. The humanists will also distinguish between U and a V, whereas Carolingian scripts very rarely do that. Some Proto-Gothic scripts do, but Carolingian scripts, it's quite rare. They also have biting letters in humanist minuscules, such as the AE, the CT, as we can see in the right hand corner of this image. You can see in the top row, you have the G that looks like a pair of glasses, like a pair of spectacles, which incidentally existed by the time you had humanist script developed. We can see that there's not really serifs at the bottom of these letters, like we might have in Proto-Gothic. And I mean, otherwise, frankly, these letters are quite similar to their Carolingian counterparts. So it can be quite easy to get them confused. You and you know, it's an attempt to imitate Caroline, so that's there's good reason why it's like that. You just have to be on the lookout for the few giveaways that you'll find. So here is a text, another text from a fight book, because this is the kind of stuff I love. Um <laughs> and it's a very interesting one um so in most medieval fight books or not all but um many of them had some kind of poem like a memory verse that summarized the whole of their art of combat and then it had prose sections that elaborated on the poem in greater detail now my the style that i study that of fiore de libri he seems to have written mostly in prose, he doesn't have much verse. But in this uh, manuscript, the Pisani Dossi manuscript, we have this poem here written in Latin, even though the rest of the manuscript is written in Italian. And it's sort of this like summary of his art. And this is written in a sort of a mixture of Gothic, cursive and humanist script. Um, I've seen different opinions as to whether it's humanist or Gothic. Um, 
I, I think it, it's it's more humanist to be sure, um, but it's quite bad humanist basically. Um, and although it's quite faded, I'll try to read it out to you. Um, from the top line, it says, Armorum actis actus site delectant amice, noscere, goodness, te cum arm aneas, I can't read that, toti quod talia, quod artia monstrat, I think that's artia monstrat, sis audax atque avansus nec senis adesto, uh, nil, nil mesti sit, no, I can't read it. Some of it's a bit too faded to read, um, but you you can get the gist of me reading along. You'll notice that there's both the cursive and the tall S. You'll notice that the words are separated. You'll notice there's a high amount of abbreviation. You'll notice that the T's are biting, and these are all ways that we can tell that it's um, ca- um, human is minuscule and not Caroline. Here is another one, and this one's clear as I actually can read it to you. Um, la lanza longa che si usa in mano, quanto è più longa fatto a me inganno. Si è magistri uh, con lei in guardia si stanno, con passo i rattere subito lor ferri uh, torno, tanti de parte dritta che Defesa presto lo rebatter se fa for se fa fora destrada a ah, lo rebatter se fa fora destrada e no inerto e lo rebatter a uh, vos essere un brazo in la lanza e che contra fa tanto più fazza falaccia. So this paragraph is basically telling you how to um, position yourself uh, and it's explaining the drawing above which shows the masters in, in their guards with spears. It says, con paso y rebate, subito lo fare somo. So we, we will sort of suddenly react with a pass and a beating away of your weapon. Um, so this is teaching you combat techniques and to comment on the script, we can see all of these usual features like the biting T. We can see in this one actually we have we mostly have the tall S, um, but we have the Gothic style of R actually. We can see this quite notably in the fourth line in the third word, compasso y rebater. Um, you do sometimes get this in Carolingian, but not very often, it's quite rare. We also see in the um, one, two, three, four fifth line, the second word from the end, this is deri, goodness, deri, deri usa, and it's a bit hard to, um, to say, um, but we can see that the, the de there, um, is joined, it's merged, it's biting together, that de over there. Um, because this is a practice known from Gothic. Same thing as well in the second line up from the bottom. El rebater vol S, um, E double S, those two S's are biting into each other there. So these are some of the features that identify this as humanist and not as Caroline. Here is another manuscript from a fight book. This is a much better and more prestigious form of humanist minuscule and you can probably tell from the beautiful quality of this illuminated H over here um, and it is from Filippo de Vardi's fight book who comes about a generation after Fiori and basically copies him so Filippo de Vardi might well have been a student of Fiori de Libri it's not fully shit clear and this is quite uh, simple you guys probably don't need me to read it but I'll just like rattle it off to you um, Avendo mi mossa per appetito naturale, quale producea fuori el mio franco animo alieno da ogni vilitate nelle mei primi ed floridi anni anacti e cose bellicose. Così per processo di tempo cre. Blah, blah, blah. And this, he's basically saying, having had an ap- a natural appetite uh, from the flower of my youth, um, I was drawn to acts. So it's bellicose 
acts and things, which through a process of time, and then he goes on to talk about how he developed his skills with time. And this is the beginning of his long prologue where he basically rips off Fiori's life story and talks about how he's always been a great fighter and he's had an appetite for combat. Um, this is a very interesting um, treatise on painting from the Renaissance, um, not a pingendio azio, um note on painting. And um, it's just quite cool because we get, we get to see the process of how they're learning about art as they, um, as as the skills are developing in the early, sorry, in the late Middle Ages. Um, and this is a reasonably, well, it's not, it's, the nib's a bit too thin. To be Carolingian, we can see the biting teas. We can see a lot of ductus actually, relatively. Um, we can see, do we have any curled S's? I don't see any curled S's, but we have Gothic abbreviations like the Harum. We have, we have commas, I think, one or two. Yes, we have commas. Um, and all of these are features that mark it out as Gothic. So, well, in the Gothic era, it doesn't mark it out as humanist minuscule script. Here is just an interesting one because um, it is some of the earliest records of Mesoamerican languages in a goodness, I believe this is a text from the 1500s, maybe 1600s, and it's written in a rather developed cursive humanist minuscule. So I can't read this, I have no idea what it says, but it's um, it may be quite interesting to s scholars of um, Mesoamerican linguistics. So it's worth going back to talk about some aspects of scholarship at the time, and this is about classical Latin, academics, and the vernacular. So by the 15th century, the vernacular languages, especially Italian and French, which was the spoken lingua franca of Europe from the Middle Ages until about the Second World War, Italian and French were being used in scholarly and legal context and even in printed books, as we'll see in a bit. And humanist Latin scholars of the time, they wanted to move away from the simpler, more intelligible style of medieval Latin. And so they attempted to write like Cicero in Virgil, and at the same time, regional accents of cultivated Latin were actually developing, and Erasmus complains of Latin teachers from different parts of the world not being able to understand each other when they speak. And note that in the 16th century, there's also a flourishing of mezzito Latin literature, so Latin literature written by people of mixed, his, like Hispanic, so sort of European Spanish, and Meso in indigenous Mesoamerican descent in the Americas who are writing Latin literature because they were educated um, by their Spanish, usually fathers, in Latin. And there's a relatively large corpus of quite high quality literature written by these mezzitos, which is just not very studied in classical syllabi and whatnot. And it's a shame because it's can provide very fascinating insights to Latin literature in general. But this is sort of the problem with classics as an institution is it's very close off to non-canonical, non-ancient Greco-Roman works. And part of this sort of cult of the classics that we have all the way to this day was cultivated by Erasmus of Rotterdam, who was a leading humanist scholar. And he wrote these sort of classic-esque colloquia, which basically... Um, are conversations to help you learn everyday Latin, and these colloquia are um, that Erasmus wrote, as compared to the colloquia written by other teachers in his time, like Corderius. Um, Erasmus's colloquia are just unnecessary. So, as an, as an equivalent, um, we might be teaching someone how to speak English today, and we'll teach instead of teaching them just "Hey, how are you doing?" or "Hey, what's up?" It's like a simple greeting, right? Erasmus would be like "Hey, what's up?" Hello, good day, how are you? How are you, good sir? What a wonderful morning it is. How does the morning greet you, good sir? And he goes on and on and on, teaching you how to have these like very um, roundabout phrases, um, asyndetic syntax. It's a nightmare, it's absolutely horrible. And it's not really like how spoken Latin seems to have been used at the time, except for maybe among his students. And he said that his students should be monkeys in imitation of Cicero. So really just trying to copy the Romans in their language, just like they were trying to copy the Romans in their script. And this is a photo of the guy. Um, 
very important scholar, to be slightly fair to him, got a lot going for him, but fuck him. He did a lot to like make Latin the, he, he's, he's the reason we have this image of Latin today as this mystical, refined, unintelligible, inscrutable object, when in reality it's, to quote Reginald Foster, every prostitute in ancient Rome spoke fluent Latin, you know, it's not very difficult, but he made us think it is. This leads us, or don't lead us, but I'm randomly segueing to incunabula and the standardization of vernaculars. So, incunabula are early printed books that were produced before the Gutenberg press. That's just the term we have for them. It means sort of little stamped things. Because printers were producing books for a market rather than individual commissions, which had been the case when you were getting books through secular scriptoria from the 13th century onwards, the printers like William Caxton, who was the first to print books in English, William Caxton was interested both in printing vernacular texts, which could be more broadly read by Latin, but also in making these vernacular texts accessible to as wide a range as possible, because there's no point in, in you printing in the vernacular language so that ostensibly you can reach more people. You may be able to reach more social classes of people beyond the educated, but if only people in your small region, say of London, can understand your dialect, and people up in Birmingham or Manchester or whatever can't understand what you're writing, you can't sell your books to them so it's not as profitable. So these early printers, especially when they started printing Bibles in the vernacular, they wanted to make these vernaculars intelligible to as many dialects from around the country as possible. And most Sprachwunder, which is sort of language regions, exist on a dialect continuum. We're quite used today to the dominance of standardised national languages such as standard British English, but in the Middle Ages this wasn't really the case, and it was the printing press which in many ways gave the impetus towards standardization of vernaculars for the first time. The printing of Bibles and texts that were going to be distributed around a country were the first time where it really mattered to have a standard version of the language that everyone could read and understand. And the fact that these books would became available around the country helped to spread standard English to some degree, especially standard spelling or relatively standardized spelling around the country. And we can, so, we normally, in, in the present day, are just used to hearing standard British English if we live in the UK, or also obviously American English. But a good example of the differences in dialect continuum is the difference between standard British English and Scots, right? So if you go from London and you go up slowly to the north until we get to Scotland, the local sort of informal varieties of English get closer and closer it's not necessarily a direct line of getting closer and closer to Scots, but, you know, the Scottish of, sorry, the English spoken in Durham will be closer to Scots than the English that's spoken in London. As an example, there's a continuum where people in neighbouring regions will be able to understand each other better than people in regions which are more disparate, even if they're speaking the same language. So even though somebody in Edinburgh might be speaking what we call Scots, and we might call it a separate language, and somebody in Durham is supposedly speaking English, the person in Durham will probably be able to understand the, this person from Scotland better than a person from Durham speaking in their local variety of English would be able to understand somebody from London, as an example. Because the dialects of London and Durham are much more different because of the geographic distance than the dialects of Durham and Scotland, as a crude example. I don't know how well I've explained this, but um, let's, we want to show you. This is a replica of a Gutenberg printing press, and in certain museums you can actually see original Gutenberg printing presses. It's quite cool. And obviously the existence of the printing press hugely increased the productivity of Book production people people could just make a vastly greater quantity of books at a much greater speed and this helped to spread literacy among common people much more easily you could go to bookshops now and buy books for much cheaper than you could before here is one of my favorite um printer books it's um by uh Pietro Montes um he is a Spanish fencing master and he wrote this brilliant book um, Artis Militaris Collectanea in Tres Libros. So it's um, 
a, a collection of military arts and it's an amazingly compendious book hundreds of pages like 600 something pages where he talks about anything you can think to imagine he even has a chapter on how you run uh, in a sort of appropriate way to fight and the reason this is this book is so appealing to me is it teaches you how to fight with loads of weapons which in many of the fight books don't get covered because as i mentioned in an earlier video most of the late medieval fight books teach you how to fight predominantly with a sword in two hands and they don't focus on many other common weapons like knives or even just clubs um well they do they do knives in the form of daggers but they don't focus on everyday things like axes or clubs like you might find in a average fantasy game and i quite like that aspect that we can like learn how to fight with these all of the same kinds of weapons that your characters might be wielding in world of warcraft or league of legends or what have you and here's another one it is um one of the first printed books as well uh and this is i believe this is agrippa maybe mangelino uh the opera nova it's a quite extensive treatise on the art of fighting written in italian and this is a example of humanist script being used in the printing press so that back here is gothic script fairly standard gothic typeface and then that here is humanist in the printing press and this is what leads us to the the end of our course because the gutenberg printing press was what signaled the beginning of mass-produced paper books and because you had this as a mass as a means of mass producing books this made typed font the main form of literary transition from this point to the present day so although um after the 1500s handwriting obviously was still used and we have lots of handwritten books and there there are academic studies of the paleography of handwriting from these centuries and it's very important if you're looking to study time periods like the american civil war or just well any of these time periods to access records and personal books and such like this um however handwritten books were no longer the the main format in which texts were transmitted the main way in which texts were published and copied and shared around was in the printed word in the printing press and this is why we end our course here because this is the end of after this point the study of handwriting has less significance although it's still obviously very very important just as a quick side note the printing press was not without opposition there was a very interesting scholar who was also involved in mysticism called johannes tritemius and he was a benedictine scholar who in 19 so 1492 wrote a long ass treatise de laude scriptorum manualium in praise of scribes who write out by hand and we only know about this because it was printed in 1492 1494 um the wikipedia page is very fun to dive into and there we go we've come to the end here's a couple of very beautiful uh humanist manuscript this is a handwritten one it's a fight book teaching you how to fight with i believe it's yeah how to fight with a mason shield which is not a very common combination here's another one this is a personal more personal handwriting and humanist script teaching you how to fight with various weapons so quinto is with an, an axe chester is with a sort of club and then we have a dagger at the bottom with septimore and here's a last one and a good point at which to end the video and basically to end the series so now if you've been watching all the way from the beginning in roman scripts until we come now to humanist and in an ironic way we've come to humanist a script which people who wrote it thought was imitating the roman scripts way back at the beginning of this course but anyway if you've gone all the way from the beginning all the way to the very end now you should be able to go to any medieval manuscript like this one in front of me and read the script on it make a transcription of it if you speak the language translate it and hopefully this has given you the tools to start studying medieval manuscripts yourself um and accessing them there's so much available online to help you do it um 
and you can just read so many manuscripts online for free. And I really love manuscripts and the study of scripts and paleography and there's not much resources available for it on the internet for free, certainly not on YouTube. So I've made this in the hopes of sharing that knowledge with more people. And if I want to take away anything from this is like, please, if you love medieval history, go and like look at manuscripts and study them. There's so much we need to know about them and we're not finding out about them because no one's trained to do it. So please now go out there and do it. This is not the absolute end of the series because there will be one last video in this paleography guides series afterwards where we're going to look at some a few tidbits that didn't make it into the other individual script videos and we're also going to talk about the utility of studying paleography for conlangers and making your own conscripts and this kind of thing and it's use in fantasy aesthetics so have a good day guys until that next video bye